Nothing but trouble. You're a troublemaker. Bad dog. Bad dog. Bad dog. What I've been worried about are those candles that go up in the air. Yeah. They don't burn anything either. Really? No, in New Mexico, we do this every Christmas Eve. And it gets windy there. I talked to Phil yesterday. He had heard he had heard back really badly. I told him I was going to show you. So what do you think? I think
Testing, testing, can you guys hear me please? Let me know. Hello out there. Sorry, you found out this way. No, it's fine. I'm just doing a live stream. Say, do you want to say a little couple of words or you want to wait for everybody? Uh, okay. That's Fran, everybody. David Hall. Some high school folks that used to know him. Sorry, I don't have any uh, electrical outlet, so I don't have a way of putting my mic together for this. Hello, Sophie. Sophie Hahn, everyone. Say hi. Thank you so much for showing. Did you want to say something now, or I'll, I'll just keep, I was just doing something else. Are we going to speak? Yeah. Because I have a connection and sometimes when I don't connect it disconnects. <laughs> 
and I just rather keep it going. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello. I'm saying hello to you. <laughs> I haven't shared it to any groups yet, so you're welcome to. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and try and do that then. I find it easier doing it on my phone. I 
do not know Mr. Kelly as well as some. I knew him as a, the person I would often see outside of the police station. The thing I remember most is that he always remembered my name and could recognize me even when I wasn't in uniform. <laughs> Many could not do this. He was smart, kind, and willing. I'm sad to see him Thank you so much, Officer White. That was beautiful. I really appreciate that. And the average person is bringing three city manager. And he'd have 10 people out there working on doors. And they were entitled to 60% of whatever they brought in. Place to stay in the day. I'm going to do another circle because there's lots of people here, guys. I don't want you to miss everybody. She's totally unaware. Hi, Jacqueline. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Dee's here. How wonderful. Hi, Aiden. How are you? Thank you. Yep. Thank you for coming. Chief, gather some chairs so we can let people sit. Hey, Chief. Hey, how are you? Good. To get some chairs. You want to help me follow me?
Hello. the night that we found out that um, Barclay passed. So it's he's naming it Barclay, so that's what I'm gonna start with that. And um, let's, let's just listen and while we get in a circle. <coughs>
right here on these steps like when I was when I was running for city council he was sitting right here and he had his little radio going listening to the council meeting and I was going into the council meeting and I saw him and I you know I was on my campaign trail so I was giving my cards to everybody and so he was sitting here I didn't know who he was but I handed him one of my cards and he said oh you're Cheryl Davila and I'm like, yeah. And he's like, oh, I know all about you. I heard about you. Oh, I can't believe that you're here. You know, and he was so excited. And uh, he's like, well, give me some more of your cards. I'll pass them out for you. And so I just <laughs> had picked some up from the printer. And so I, I was just parked over there. And I went back to my car and gave him like a stack like this. And then, you know, he distributed them. And then the next time I saw him, he asked me for some more. So I feel like Barclay was part of the reason why I got elected. And um, he was just so kind and so sweet. You know, he was just, and then, you know, when I was still on the campaign trail, I was at the Juneteenth Festival and I rode my bike up there. And uh, I don't walk my bike because it's an old rock hopper. I got like in the 80s and it's all original, so I can't lock it up. So he was sitting there with this cart and I was like, hey, Mr. Barclay, can you do mind like watching my bike? And he's like, no, you can just like lean it up against the cart. So I did and I, I kept walking by him like, are you okay, is it okay? And he's like, yeah, you can just keep going. And so I just hung out all day and he watched my bike. <laughs> so that was amazing. And then, you know, he would call me um, you know, when I got elected every day, pretty much, you know, mm -hmm. and I just put him on speaker, continue working, talk to him, and, you know, um, he really appreciated that, I think, and I actually do that with a lot of people, too, even the haters when they were here in Berkeley, and they were calling me up, giving me mean messages, but um, I feel it's important to listen and hear what people have to say, and with Barclay, um, I, I just, I don't know what it was about him, but his passing really, really hurt my heart. And it looks like it hurt a lot of people's hearts. So, um, he was an amazing person. I used to love every time he came to council. I mean, sometimes he would get out of control and, and like be focused on one individual, but actually everything he told me was true. You know, I found out later everything he said was true. And it's unfortunate how um, he was treated because of his, the way he was. But, you know, I, that's what I think he sacrificed. I feel like he sacrificed his life to make a difference for everyone else. And so I think that that's what we have to do is try to make a difference and use his death to do that. Because he was an amazing man, and um, he was just so smart. I mean, he knew everything about what was going on on council. I don't know if he read the packet, but he knew every freaking thing about it. You know, and he would comment and make these amazing comments, and you know, and he knew exactly what was going on in the street too. He knew everything, you know, everybody, I mean, I didn't realize all the people that he knew, but it seems like he knew a lot of people and touched a lot of hearts. So um, one of his um, friends or one of his guys, I think his name's Vinay, V-I-N-A-Y or something like that. He sent me an email and he said, you know, uh, he was, like when he graduated, I guess UC Berkeley, um, he Barclay went out to um, dinner with he with his family, went to his graduation, and um, I guess he had helped him like at his storage space at one point, and um, he was able to get. He asked him for these pictures. <laughs> no, he asked him for the one when he was a kid. That was Barclay when he was young. He Barclay lived in Berkeley. 
you know, all his life, he was born and raised. Um, and uh, he sent me the pictures and he said, you know, please don't share these with anyone, but if you need photos for the memorial, you can use them. And like Barbara, not Barbara, Marsha said to me, um, well, I want to blow them up. And I'm like, you know, he specifically said, do not share these photos. And I was like, I don't know if I want to send it to you in an email, but then I decided, okay, it's same as printing, so I'm going to do it. And then I had emailed him and asked him if permission, and then he said yes. So I didn't do anything I wasn't supposed to, so that's good. But um, he, I also received um, a few emails talking about how sad people were. And then there was this one that I wanted to read to you today. Um, her name is Misha, and it's NG bomb hackle or something like that she says don't worry about i know you're going to ruin my last name but that's that's okay she told me how to pronounce her first name and she says miss davila i just wanted to thank you for taking the time to celebrate the life of william caldera i went to berkeley high school with him with william in the 80s but i have not lived in the bay area since 1989 I have not been in touch with William for a few years, but he was a friend and someone I wish I had been able to help. If you knew William, you know that he was a fiercely independent and lived his life always true to his beliefs and strict moral code. I deeply admired his dedication to his ideals, no matter what that, where that took him. The William I knew in high school and beyond was deeply hum a deeply humble person who was always in awe and inquisitive and skeptical about wor the world around him and truly dedicated to making his community a better place. Above all, I found William to be a good listener a truly rare quality to find, and I will always appreciate our time together. I am sorry that I cannot be there for the celebration of his life, but I know that he, that he touched many people in positive ways in Berkeley and the Bay Area, Nietzsche. So, um, you know, he, was always, we chose this spot because this is where I met him and he loved doing landscaping work and he would often talk about in the council meetings how much he did the landscaping right here around the police station. So there was no all other ulterior motive, we just, this is where I met him. This is where Dominic, who I don't know is here, is Dominic here? Oh, hey Dominic, I didn't know, recognize you without the hat. Um, Dominic, uh, I met Dominic one night outside of uh, where Mr. Barclay was squatting. I would often bring him food and um, I wasn't sure if he got it because I would just leave it at the doorstep and sometimes I would text him but he didn't always have his phone on so, and it was, you know, he had, I don't know, whatever. But, so one night I was in San Francisco um, uh, hearing, uh, Carl Anthony speak, and they had crab cakes and all this really killer food, and I was like, oh, well, let's bring some for Barclay, and so I did, and that was the night that I met Dominic, and Dominic was on his bicycle, and we pull up, and I'm like, who's that guy on the bicycle? Why is he standing there with his bike? And then I get out of my car, and by the time I got out of my car, Mr. Barclay was standing right there next to him, and I was so happy to see him because I hadn't seen him in a few months. And so that's how I met Dominic. And I'd like to Dominic to come up right now because this is where he met him, And if you want to, and if you want to say a few words. And then I'm going to open it up for everyone to say a few words about their experience with the guy that we really cared about, Mr. William Barclay Caldera, AKA 300.
Yeah, I'll just keep it not too long, but I appreciate everyone being here. I think it, yeah, I think it really represents how many different people 300 met in his life. Because, like, he's been here so long, and he's met a lot of people and made a lot of connections. And I think what really amazes me about him is that despite the difficulties he faced, he was really, he really loved his community, and he really served his community well. Like, like with his gardening here, like, further down. Or, or even just, like, how he always showed up to city council meetings. And I won't say I knew him like as well as other people might because I've only known him for the past four years but I was really struck by his faith as well like his faith in God and though you know things were so tough in his life and yeah Berkeley is really has really lost a really valuable member of his community um, and yeah we were really fortunate to know him and uh, May rest in peace, 300, and God bless you. Thank you. Thank you, Dominic. So I was going to call my sister. Um, my sister is a very religious person, and she was going to say a prayer for him. So I'm going to get him on the phone, but I'll hand the mic over until it for someone else. Hi, Mike. Hi, Mom. Uh -huh. I'll wait until you. My name's Cody. I knew 300 while I was living on the streets of Berkeley. Um, I would speak to him a lot until um, after a while he decided, he decided that he hated me. But I never held it against him because you know what? Being on the street sucks. It's, it's a hard life. Uh, but anyway, what a lot of people don't know is that 300 used to be a San Francisco bike messenger. I'm a San Francisco bike messenger myself. I've been on the job for over six years now. And that's why I decided to come to his memorial today. Because the messenger world, things like suicide and homelessness and mental illness and self-medication with things like prescription pills and alcohol are, are sadly all too common and, and I know that 300 had demons that he had to deal with that he had to face and um, I'm trying not to like get emotional here um, but it's, I, I hadn't spoke I haven't I hadn't spoken to him in like like three or four years, but when I found out that he died on Facebook, I couldn't believe it. So I called my friend Paul and I said, "Is 300 dead?" Because that's what I'm hearing about. And he's like, "Yeah, 300 is is dead." Um, there's a lot of people on the streets of the Bay Area that are dying right now as I speak, dying on the street. And 300 was, up, up until recently, one of them. And I guess I had a, a stronger connection to 300 because he did what, what, what I do for a living. And, and one of the things I got to know about 300 before he decided to, to cut me off was that he was a very independent-minded person. And I could tell that he was, an, he was an independent bike messenger. That's a phrase that we use to describe people who, who don't hew to the common group thing. And I could tell that 300 was that. And so I decided that I was going to be that too, that I would be independent, that, that I would use my intellect to analyze what's going on around me and, and be my own person. And so now, today, I'm not homeless, I'm not on the street. I used my profession to get off the street and to go to San Francisco State. And way back when, 
I had racist beliefs. I read Mein Kampf. I, I believe what Mein Kampf said. I hated African Americans, Jews, you name it. I said racist things to people. I hang, hung around racist people. And 300 didn't like that, and that was one of the reasons why he eventually cut me off. But he motivated me to finally leave that behind. And so when I got off the street and went back to school, I finally grew the hell up and abandoned those ideas and became a tolerant but open-minded person. And so I'll listen to the far right, I'll listen to the far left, but I'm not going to go down the road either of them lay for intolerance. I, I want to see the world become a more united place. And, and William, in his own way, by basically telling me to F off, <laughs> pushed me to do that. You know? Because hate and bigotry kills relationships that we have with people. And unfortunately, it killed the relationship that I had with 300. But I guess his legacy for me is that I'm not a white supremacist asshole. I, mean, yeah. I, I guess that's all that matters. Thank you, 300. That's amazing. That's amazing. And I just wanted to thank um, the members of the city that are here, D. Williams Ridley, uh, Chief Greenwood, Paul Budenhagen. So, a uh, council member, Sophie Mon, Jay Kalekian from the Rent Board, Chris Nasso, Shallon Allen, anybody else? And Chief uh, Berkeley, Hi. Jacqueline McCormick. <laughs> Thank you, and everybody here. Thank you for being here. So I'm going to get my sister back on the phone. Her name is Lynette, and um, she's um, disabled and lives in Clear Lake, and she's always home. So I gave Barclay uh, her phone number because, you know, he loves to talk. And she likes to talk, but he never called her. But she, she would, I would tell him, tell her about him. So she felt like she knew him, and she's actually pretty distraught about this whole thing too, even though she really didn't. She never met him. But um, here we go. Here you go, Lynette. Hello. On speaker. Yes. Wait. 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 Sorry. Wait. I have to put you on the mic. Okay. Go ahead. Your piece. Wait, let me put you on speaker first. I don't know. Do a test. I do have, I hold on, we're going to do some more electronics. Hold on. I do have it here. Okay, here we go. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Lynette. Hi, Lynette. Try the speaker. Yeah. Do testing, testing on the speaker. Try it, Lynette. Just talk. She can't. She can't. Yeah, just repeat what she said. Yeah, repeat. Okay, let me just repeat what you said. Tell her to speak slowly. <laughs> Wait a second. Wait. Hold on. <laughs> I'll repeat what you said. Go ahead. <laughs> hello, everybody. Hello. She said hello, everybody in Berkeley. Oh, yeah. I'm saying hello. Hello. I'm, hold on. I have to repeat what you say, so it's going to take a second. She's going to start off with the Bible verse okay. from what? Psalm 
It is on speaker. I'll speak. I'll speak. Can you hold it with my phone? Yeah. yeah, let's do that. Hold on. Yeah, you guys need to plug it in. Yeah, never mind. I'm going to call you right back. <laughs> well, you can call me. If that doesn't work, you can use mine. No, that's okay. We got plenty of phone out there. Mine's pretty loud. Uh oh, nice. I can do interpretation, put it higher of hearing. <laughs> That's great. Yeah. Oh, right on, right on. That was awesome. And thank God for electronics, right? Um, I will teach the Psalm 101 verse 1. And let let God have mercy, and let God be seen, and let God let I'm not, I'm saying the prayer first, and so let God uh, the the voices be anointed, and and hearts be joyous, and celebration. So this psalm verses, I will sing of mercy and loving kindness and justice to you, O Lord, will I sing. And I just wanted to say, heavenly. Creator, great Father, great Spirit, creator of all of us, touch our heavy hearts right now. Let us have more compassion for those who are disabled, for those who are homeless, for those who are poor, for those who are suffering from all the ugly isms that are in America today. We're asking you, Lord, to open up hearts so that we realize what is really happening, so that we will take more action, so that we will rectify this problem. We're asking you, Lord, to welcome our dear brother, Mr. Barclay 300, a brilliant soul. And I know you'll be happy to see him. And I know that he's with you because he was a good spirit. And he did. If, if your son Jesus was on this earth, he would be doing the same thing Barclay did. All this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. 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 All right, thank you for that. Okay, thank you. Um, so now we're going to hear from Andrea, who's going to do a song. So I just wanted to mention that I, I met 300 when I was a youth minister up at St. Mark's Episcopal Church some 20-some years ago. And um, I perceived him as, as a Christian ascetic, reminding me of uh, John the Baptist, full of fire, full of righteous anger protesting that it wasn't so much about left and right, but about right and wrong. And he loved justice. He loved it and really hungered for it. And so I, I feel the power of his, his commitment to that asceticism that I don't know very many people who could bring this, uh, can I say, politically diverse crowd together. And it's quite a beautiful testament to his his strength and his willingness to engage. Um, so I wanted to offer this song, you know, and, and sadly we sang this song just a couple weeks ago on the steps of the city hall when the number of, of unhoused people that we had lost was 13 and now we add another to that, to that tragic number. And so as we offer this song of remembrance to him, certainly our prayer is that we can come together as a city and protect our sons and daughters of Berkeley. Bless to everybody in this circle. And I pray, God, may we do better. May we open our hearts wider. And may we do better. So this song is a sing-along. And 
I want you, if you will, to imagine a river, as the Tibetans do. Now we jump from Christianity to Tibet. <laughs> um, but that there's a river and that our spiritual strength may help us to cross that river. Those people who have gone and come back, they say there's a river. And they say that when uh, a body, when a spirit leaves a body that for 40 days, that they are in that place. And so if that's true, let's offer this together. So it says, stand tall by the water and know no fear or loneliness and let this love cross you over and let this song bid you well. So when you feel, please lean in and help me sing this song. Stand tall by the water Know no fear or loneliness Let this love cross you over Let this song lead you Well, I can recall the love you gave well, I can recall the time. Well, I can recall the love you give. Well, I can recall the time. Stand tall by the water. No, no fear or loneliness. Let this love cross you over, let this song lead you, well I can recall the love you give, well I can recall the time, well I can recall the love you give, well I can recall the time, stand tall by the water, by the water, no, no fear or loneliness Let this love cross you over Let this song lead you well Let this love cross you over Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Such a beautiful singer. Thank you. Now we're going to have James come up and say a few words. <coughs> My legs are getting out of here. Boy, what a hard act to follow. Cody, you're magnificent. And Andrea with your talent. And all our neighbors here from Berkeley, a very diverse crowd. It's great to see everybody. I'm bringing two messages, one from Carol Denny and one from Igor. Uh, Carol's on the, west, or on the East Coast. And she wrote me this morning and said, it's so upsetting that he was taken to John George. I spoke to him a lot in the last two months. And although he constantly talked about suicide, and wanting to die, he was in despair over going anywhere near that place. At least Cheryl Dowell had treated him with dignity and respect. All he ever wanted was a home. I'm so sorry not to be there. I send my condolences and my regrets. And I'm going to leave it at that because there were some other personal things here. She said no one else should die in Berkeley. Embarrassing wealth, wealthy streets. So that's, that was from Carol this morning. And uh, this evening, Igor sent me sentiments that I probably can relate to as many as well as many here, as well as many here this evening. <coughs> wrote a long, a long note here. It's with extreme sadness that I heard the tragic news of 300's passing. I keep thinking about how the system failed someone with his intellect, his warmth his sense of humor and commitment to serving the community, all while he struggled to bring to the life a system that ended up doing him in. I keep 
thinking about whether there's something more that I could have done, and I so wish that I had. From the time he came to the, one of the first Labor Commission meetings, and we struck him a friendship, I found his comments on the state of our city to be far more insightful than they were at the times incisive. We didn't always agree, but the more challenging his critiques were to take, the more I came to realization over time that he had been right all along. As we built up trust, and as 300 opened up to me, I had the opportunity to pick up whatever he was willing to share about his life, how he grew up, where he worked, and how he nearly overcame his struggles. In so many ways, he has been the conscience of our city, and tonight my conscience is not clear. How could it be when a former commissioner went from having a roof over his head to being displaced and passing alone at a bus stop? 300. May your memory be a blessing to those of us who have been privileged to know you through times, good and bad, in sickness and in health. May your conscience give us the courage, the wisdom, the strength to do the right thing for so many of our sisters and brothers who walk and sleep the streets of Berkeley. Rest in power, my dear friend, Igor. Thank you, Igor. Thank you, Carol. Thank you, Cheryl, for doing this this evening. Thank you. Um, does anybody else have anything to say? I know I, I appointed, um, just come on up, uh, um, Barb Clay to the Homeless Commission, and when he came into the building to fill out the paperwork, he was so elated to be on the fifth floor and to walk down the hallway. Uh, and um, that was, um, he said he had never been there before, so. And then he had the courage to even run for the rent board. So it, it, it sure kind of, I think it lifted him up to do that. Um, can I ask you to turn off the camera? I'll just put it to the side. Audio recording. There are muted? other... I don't think so. I'll lose my connection. Uh, can you just talk softly? <laughs> sure you There's public people wanting to hear this. Turn it off? Yeah. Okay. I'll turn it off. Hey, hello, everyone. Um, uh, my name's uh, Louis Grimm, and um, I've been living on California Street for almost 20 years. And uh, I met 300, I knew him as 300, um, and I think 97. Um, I, I think I'd recently quit being a messenger, and we had that connection as a messenger, and I, I was number 243, but I didn't, I didn't take that as my, <laughs> I didn't take that as a name, um, but I respect that he did, and I always um, knew him as 300 and called him 300. Um, and, uh, you know, he's just such a, an, an insightful and, um, you know, just colorful, loving man. Um, and uh, he always put a smile on my face. Um, sometimes it was disturbing what I heard from him. But the more, I'm so glad I came tonight because the more I hear, the more I realize that, um, you know, he knew what he was talking about. And, um, you know, when I heard about that $500 to $2,500 dollar increase I mean I, I thought that he was having a paranoid delusion and now I come to find out this is this is actually true um, and you know it's symbolic of what's happening and um, you know I've been here almost 20 years I love Berkeley I love the you know the, the good things about the community that that we have that you know, you know that, that we do for each other and um, you know we're in a crisis and this is a wake-up call what whatever we can do to try and you know save the, the, the community feel that, that we've cultivated all this time. Um, like for example, um, you know, I have a friend who has issues. I'm gonna, I, I can't stay up, stay up here very long because I need to call him and check on him and see how he's doing because you know, he could be suicidal. And so it's a wake up call for us to do whatever we can, whether it's you know, doing more for our, our, our you know, loved ones and friends and associates who um, you know, have uh, mental issues um, and to you know do things in the community to try and you know fight these these greedy corporate interests that are, are trying to hijack our community and destroy everything we've tried to create for decades and you know make Berkeley a, a First Amendment um, oasis and a, a place of tolerance and understanding and love and um, 
you know, it's it's really it's really hard um, for you know for me to talk about um, 300 because I, you know, he called me desperate, and I'm having my own living situations like we all are. So many of us are having, you know, we're we're living places where we we're living there out of necessity, you know, because it's so it's so hard to get a new place for a lot of us. We don't have the credentials, we don't have the savings. You know, and I was dealing with my own housing crisis, and I couldn't help him. And it breaks my heart, you know, that I was in that situation. And so, um, yeah, maybe if we if we unify, you know, we can do more um, and and try and improve the situation, and and you know, and and claim our community that is rightfully ours. Um, and you know, I'm I'm not saying you shouldn't be here if you're wealthy or, but you know, it's we have to prioritize. There's got to be equality. We have to, to fight and work thoughtfully for equality. And um, this this is a tragedy, you know, um, that I, I still can't get my brain around right now. So anyway, it's great to see everyone. And um, you know, maybe there'll be some new connections made here that will eventually help us in our, our struggle um, to, you know, to keep Berkeley a place of tolerance and um, where and diversity. So anyway, um, thank you everyone, and um, you know, God bless you and. Um, Rest in power, 300. Thank you. Uh, hi, uh, my name is David. Um, I'm a housing attorney at the East Bay Community Law Center here in Berkeley. Um, I actually was representing Mr. Caldera um, during a number of his eviction lawsuits from August of last year until he ended up getting evicted this year. Um, I first met him in the court in the halls of the Hayward Hall of Justice, which is a cruel, cruel irony to even call that place that. Um, and he always struck me as a very intelligent man. Um, we struck up a number of conversations. Um, when he finally came in to the East Bay Community Law Center, I agreed to represent him. Um, I defended him in five from five evictions successfully. Um, that may not really matter because we lost the sixth one, which is what resulted in getting evicted and being on the streets. Um, I probably talked to him at least once a week from August of last year to this year. Um, as I said, he was a very caring person. He could drive you bananas sometimes, but he had a brilliant mind, an incisive wit, a great sense of humor, um, and I always enjoyed talking to him. He came up with actually a fairly legal, novel legal argument that we use to this day and are still beating evictions on. Wow. Um, wow. It was, it was very difficult by the end. He clearly, as a number of folks have alluded to, had a lot of demons. He was fighting a lot of battles. Um, and I, I think a lot of people did try really hard. I tried to look him up with social services. Um, there, it, ultimately, though, it was his decision. You can't force anyone to do anything. You can't. It's disrespectful to take someone's autonomy away. So I never would have considered that, um, despite you know, second guess yourself and you wonder, well, if I could have done this, would he still be alive? Um, but I just wanted to say that it's so great to see so many people out here who were touched by him. Um, he was a really great person. And I'm really, really sad that this is happening. Thank you, Nuno. much and thank you Cheryl for putting this together for him and for all of us I really appreciate it and I know we all do there's three things that really stand out for me um, brilliance eloquence and elegance Barkley was a truly and obviously brilliant person. He was a savant. He was incredibly well read. He knew the Bible. He knew religion. He knew ethics. He knew philosophy. He was an incredible observer. And he spoke the truth like a perfect bell ringing. He came to zoning adjustments board meetings for many years when I was on that board, and he would comment. And sometimes you would first think, it was a little off. And then 
10, 15 seconds into it, you would realize that he was speaking the truth so clearly. And sometimes with, with accusation and always justified. And I was actually delighted when he, when I got to the council and realized that he also came to all council meetings. <laughs> and he did the same thing. He sat and he listened intently. And when he spoke, you always got a little afraid because you knew he was going to reveal something very deeply true and likely uncomfortable. Um, but I learned so much every time he spoke. I always listened very carefully to his words. So that was his brilliance. Then his eloquence, how he spoke. Um, an incredible speaker, amazing turns of phrase, um, wit, um, just an incredible ability to thread together words in a very powerful way. Um, and that always struck me. And last for me is his elegance. I found his style to be absolutely gorgeous. I loved his uh, scarves that he always wore, the beautiful cross, he had a sense of drama. Um, his his uh, clothing was often flowing. Um, and I think he put a lot of time and thought into how he presented himself. And um, I just really appreciate somebody with a lot of style. <laughs> uh, and he really, he really had that. Um, he's a beautiful man, a big man, big physically, big as a person, a big presence, a great big mind, a big heart, and it's uh, really hard to believe that, that he's gone. Um, so I miss him, I will miss him, I know we will all miss him, and I just pay tribute to a great man, so thank you. My name is Armando Davila, and I met 300 a couple blocks away on Addison when I was 16 at Berkeley High. And I don't know how many of you have grown up here, but growing up in Berkeley, the homeless population, the mentally ill, or, or the correct term is, it's very much was just a part of my childhood. Seeing people on the streets, suffering, having fun, doing drugs, supporting each other, sharing meals at People's Park. You know, scattered throughout the city. I didn't. I never really thought critically of that as a child. I just accepted it. I never felt threatened by these folks on the street. In fact, I had many, many wonderful interactions with them. And I always thought that that was such a wonderful part of our city that those people could be safe here to be themselves and take up the space that they were taking up. And as I've gotten older. And I've realized how deep the impulse is to erase them right now. I've really, to be honest, <laughs> come to hate the city a little bit. And it's class politics. It's disgusting. It's utterly disgusting. The desire to erase these people from our community. To criminalize living in their cars, tenting on the streets all the budget that goes into ripping up these tent encampments, knowing what's going on in this region, knowing the reality of how hard it is to survive here. And he hated that too. And we are fighting and fighting and fighting against that. And the impulse to just erase people, it just, it pisses me off so much. I went to the Hayward Court of Injustice Maybe we could call it, I don't know. And with him one day, I gave him a ride and sat with him in his court hearing and went with him to the rent board and they didn't want to deal with him, but they did because I was there and I won a lot of favor with him because of that. And, you know, I, I feel terrible too because I didn't do enough, didn't do enough. And it sucks. 
it sucks to be to not have the capacity to intervene in someone's life in the way that we know that they need and to witness them decay and then to, for them to not answer your text message and not know what's happened to them. I mean, thank you for putting this together, Mom. You know, for having the insight for that. You know, it's fucking sad. It's so sad. I remember when you were running, there was a death on San Pablo and Addison. And we had a vigil there, and I didn't know who that person was. And people are dying on the streets. And yeah, he was brilliant, as everyone has said. And I wish I had joked that I would take him on a clothing shopping mission. I never did. I feel so bummed about that. He, he wanted to, too. I know. Aww. But yeah, I mean, Chief, you're here. Thank you for being here, Chief. And I, you know, I would ask that you really fight against the impulse in the city to erase people from the streets. I know that's a hard bargain, as they say, the customer is always right. But <laughs> that's bullshit. You know, the people in the city who want to make it a paradise for the wealthy. You, like, we can't have that. Where will these people go? It takes resources to rip them away, just as it takes resources just to house them and to care for them. And I wish I could have said that to everyone from the city who was here. Some folks have left. And... Yeah, it just makes me so sad. And as we know, the world's only going to get more intense. And if we aren't building the muscle the cultural capacity for people to belong, that, you know, with climate change and increased inequality, our capacity to hold people in this period, the century of collapse, is critical. Without that, our social fabric will continue to tear and rip apart. And that frightens me more than anything. As a young person who knows my century is going to suck, my lifetime's only going to get worse, this world's systems are only going to become further and further unstable, it just frightens me to no end to see, I mean, I'm just going to continue to rail on Berkeley a little bit, you know, it's like supposed to be the most progressive capital of California, but we know it's the also the center of political hypocrisy, liberal hypocrisy, class hypocrisy, and I'm like, if it's... If, People aren't safe here. Where are they actually safe? Where can they be safe? And that tears at my heart. And I don't know what we can do. Passing human rights ordinance here in the city. The right to housing. I don't know. Name it 300. <laughs> 300 ordinance, perhaps. I don't know. But yeah, it sucks to make him a symbol. But if we could make him a martyr who achieved his aim after death, he would be grateful. Yeah. I know that he would love that. And so I hope he's shouting at you from the other side. <coughs> Thank you. Well, we'll see. I don't know. Is anybody else? Are there more people that, yeah. yeah. So yeah. Somebody else wants to go, come up and go for it. I was thinking I would close with a prayer. Oh, yeah, yeah we're there. we want to speak. Yeah, we want to speak. Yeah. Chief, are you And then when you're done, we know. Come on, Oh, you're down there. 300, because the city, in his opinion, saw him. can't hear you. 300, because the city, in his opinion, saw him as another number. So, my name is Aiden Hill. Um, 300's passing was especially painful for me because I was, after he couldn't come to homeless commission meetings anymore, uh, Cheryl Davila appointed me in his stead. And uh, when I talked to him, he, I had his blessings to do so. Uh, I met him during the campaign trail last year, and uh, it was at city council meetings, and. He would always speak to me afterwards and say, Mr. Hill, um, try to really convey what the city is doing to all of us in many ways, especially the most at risk. 
especially those who are poor and disabled. Uh, he wrote something on Twitter and tagged me and Thomas Lord in it. Um, in my opinion, the most vulnerable and underserved people in Berkeley are the victims of poverty who are being forced into homelessness by employment and housing discrimination. Social inequality is now the official policy in Berkeley. And uh, right before he passed, I, I met him on Telegraph Avenue, and he really did tell me and made sure I knew that this was not the city that he grew up in anymore. This was a different city. And uh, we, we shared similar views that the three by three ordinances were cruel and inhumane punishment, that the RV bans were cruel and inhumane punishment, and that this sense of destruction that the officials of the city are bestowing upon people without their consent, knowing that multiple people who are poor go up to those city council meetings and expect that their voices to be heard and the new information that they're given is to be underscored. And I know that's why he ran for rent board. And it seemed as this was systemic failure that this was an attack on 300 and people like him. And this violence is happening to so many people in the city right now and so many people who because of these new laws are having to take down their tents in the mornings and wait until dark, dark and wet nights especially to put them back up. And he was against that. He wanted something different. And uh, I, I tried I tried to win for him. And I made sure he knew that. And I made sure that I would stay out until 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock AM every Tuesday to talk to him, to show him that something in this city is trying to build out of this violence. That there are so many people here who care and love everyone who belongs here. And it breaks my heart that the last thing he knew was a city that did not want him. And um, for 300, it's so important that we move towards not only rent control, but why, why in God's name do we have rental increases up to $3,000? There's so many people out here who only get government stipends for 500, let alone 700 maximum. Why do they have to spend all their money on just trying to find a safe place to shower and sleep? And we need to find a different way. We need community land trust. We need to stop criminalizing alternative housing sources today, yesterday. And I know, uh, he would always stay by um, by the Berkeley Library until he was taken from that. He was taken away from the place that he knew and was put into Alta Bates. And he had no kind words for Alta Bates, but he had worse words for Kaiser that's coming up. But I know throughout all of this, he would be happy that we're here today. We, he'd be happy that we showed that we gave a fuck, that he mattered to the city, that he mattered to people's lives, that he made a difference. Because he made a difference in my life. And, um, I know, I know 300, he's not a symbol, he's a, he was a person deeply compassionate person that did not understand why people didn't want to listen to him. And uh, I hope at least 300 voices speak out because of the life he lived. I wish I can wish all I want, but 
I really wish that we had this kind of turnout with 300 present in person so that we could all talk to him about what the possibilities are. What can we possibly do to help 300 out? In all of the instances, I hear there were a lot throughout his unfortunate endeavors. He was a twin like me, so I had that type of connection with him. Both Francine and I helped him. We, uh, we met him when he was experiencing uh, landlord issues off of the address in, um, off of University Avenue. And um, his landlord was harassing him. It was horrible. I experienced the harassment myself. The landlord was yelling at me when I was trying to leave the property after going to see him about helping him with his case. As a tenant, you have a right to have visitors. This was so off the wall. And I feel bad. I feel bad that I couldn't help him more. Um, like others, he cut me off when I tried to get him some medical help. He had a problem with his wrist. And I'm like, 300? You gotta get care for your wrist. But he didn't want to hear it. And so for a while after that, he didn't talk to me. And then I didn't know what happened to him. I lost connection. And, um, he got evicted. And that's when I learned he was on the street. And I seen him over at the West Berkeley Library. And I was like, oh, that's great. I, I found where he's at. It's, you, you lose connection with people real easily when they become evicted. You don't have telephone connection any longer. Um, but I'm glad though, because I mean, not glad about that, but I'm glad about Berkeley. Berkeley is amazing. People who care, they keep connected. And I found out through Aiden where he had left because uh, he was at the West Berkeley at one point and then he moved. I'm like, oh no, he's gone again. Where did he go? I need to know where he went. I need to know that he's okay. I need to check on him. Not that I knew what to do because I was in despair. I didn't know what to do for him. But at least I could get some food with my sister, Francine, and give him some water that he needed. He said to me, Christine, you're gonna make me pee in my pants with this water. I'm like, oh gosh, <laughs> everybody needs water. <laughs> um, he had an amazing um, intellect, personality, um, very clean, very organized when I went to visit him in his apartment. It had to be just right, otherwise you couldn't come inside. So I had to wait outside for like, I don't know, five, 10 minutes. I'm like, what is taking so long? Our appointment was 10 minutes ago. But you know, he was something else. And I'm really sad that he's gone. And I wanna make a change. I want people with disabilities to have more rights because I feel like once we accept one, another, and another, and another, and another, and another goes on. And I'm connected to this person, so I wasn't connected to the other ones before 300. But I know how it is to be evicted, and I know how it is to be on the streets. I know it's not safe. 300 didn't do any crimes, he didn't drink alcohol, he didn't do drugs. He was very much on the up and up, and he liked the police, did like the police. And he did a lot of gardening everywhere. He loved to do gardening. He loved to go to city council meetings. 
even called Mayor Ergin your highness. <laughs> Don't you remember that? <laughs> I liked when he read the items, you know, because I was like, oh, what item are we on? You know, I'm too busy trying to do my thing. And he would read right from the item, the titles. <laughs> so I would know where we were at. Um, I'm devastated, and I don't want any more of this. I, uh, I think as a community we can make a change. And I'm not just saying that. I really do. I think that everybody here has proven that we all know what's going on. We all know what the cracks are. And we can try and do something about this. We can try and prevent another death from happening. We don't have to experience the heartache. One thing I learned from this all is I know everybody has a certain capacity to deal with a certain amount of grief or you know heartache or whatnot, because it is, it's devastating, it's heartbreaking. Is when somebody's going through something and it's too big for you to deal with, don't turn your back. Maybe take a moment, maybe go to therapy. I think I'm gonna go to therapy again. <laughs> But don't turn your back. Don't don't put the block on. Take a rest from it. Try to figure it out. But once you close your mind, once you turn your back, that opportunity isn't there anymore. It's gone. And a lot of people turn their backs on people and they end up with nobody in the world. Obviously, 300, he reached out to a lot of folks. He talked to a lot of people. He got to know a lot of people in the city, and I'm happy for that. He was loved. He's very loved. I want to thank you for all of that. Thank you for talking to him and being his friend and being patient, even when, you know, he made you angry. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you, 300. I'm sorry to see you go. Thank you. Hi, I'm Eileen. Um, I live at Harriet Tubman Terrace. And, um, can you hear me? No. Okay. I only knew uh, 300 for five days. And unfortunately for me, it was his last five. Could you point it at your mouth? I'm sorry. There, I that's perfect. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. much yeah. better. Um, I just want to say that he gave out a message over and over again, which wasn't a message that I really wanted to share today because I was fearful for his dignity. Um, when I met him, I was quite surprised at the kind of human being he is. And I was so surprised that uh, nobody else seemed to know it and that he was very alone at that bus stop and that the biggest concern he had was a bathroom and that we're all out here talking about what we should do what we could do what we ought to do what we might have done and really you know we're some pretty smart people out here we could get up some bathrooms for people that are houseless and I, I took water to him and he didn't want to drink it because there was no bathroom. That's right. And he said, I don't want to drink the water. I said, you know, you have to drink water or you'll die. And he said, yes. And, um, and then I found out that my neighbors loved him too. And then other people went to the bus stop and talked to him and gave him food and water and saw what a really wonderful person he was. And I thought, wow, what a gift. But why did he have to suffer such indignity of not having a bathroom, you know? And the other thing, of not having garbage collected. Like, why is it that when people are poor, that all of a sudden their needs to go to the bathroom or have their garbage collected 
no longer seem important to anybody. Right. You know, and everybody talks about them like they're filth and they're dirt. And yeah, when you're houseless, it's really hard to stay clean. And it's really hard to go to the bathroom. And if you should have a horrible accident because of some rotten food you had to eat, then you can't even clean yourself up. And so I guess I said it, even though I was worried about his suffering. He was afraid of the police because he didn't want to go to the hospital because he was afraid of how they would treat him because of the condition he was in. And like I spent days on the telephone. And he didn't want the help that was offered. And I suspect when he was 5150 that he was not at all out of control, but that they just realized he would, he would die if he didn't go to a hospital. And all I want to say is I'm glad to know you're all here and that so many people cared about him. I'm not sure, though I hope, that he knew that. And I just think we should all get together and get bathrooms for Berkeley and get garbage collection for people without money. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much. The five-day relationship. That's yeah. amazing. Oh. Wow. It's, um, your turn now. Oh, quick. Okay, no, you don't Thank have to be. Hi guys, um, I, I met um, 300 William. Probably on the first time I really talked to him was on the uh, patio of the International House, and it was probably in the year five somewhere. I don't really know the year anymore. Mid aughts, as they say. Um, he was wearing all black, had that mustache, uh, <laughs> but did not have gray in it yet. And uh, yeah, he looked he looked quite the the part, you know. He was like, who's this dude? As a matter of fact, he, oddly enough, reminded me of my sperm donor dad, and he had my, what I considered to be my dad's first name, William. So it was a weird combination, and he's about my age. So um, I, I liked him, and I think he liked me. We always, you know, we did not cross each other without saying hi and having some small talk. Uh, he's, he's a nice guy. And I... Kind of, I was just paging through Facebook today and all of a sudden came across the Berkeley homeless site and realized, oh my God, he's dead. And I thought, well, I gotta show up to that. And I'm really happy that a lot of people are here. Um, I liked him. I think he uh, knows at least 300 people. And he probably knows another zero after that. Um, so does, I'll spread the word. I'm sure you guys will, and there will be more sadness. Uh, he was a good guy. I'm an advocate for the homeless. Uh, I do uh, I do think that all people should have housing. Uh, I don't care if it's, I mean, there's gonna always be a disparity of what type of housing that will be, but everyone should have a nest of some type. Every animal is, has the ability to create their own nest. And it is outrageous that we outlaw the ability to create our own nest and then do not provide one yeah. conversely, right? It's not, it's not civil, it's just not right. And uh, Chief, I, I realize you have a hard job to do in not trying to criminalize people and also trying to make sure that no crazy <coughs> mayhem ensues. Uh, but yeah, we have, we have a tough task ahead of us. Housing is out of control. The housing prices are outrageous around here. We need more subsidized housing. We need uh, to create more affordable housing. But I think the first and foremost, if 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 we need we need to get federal in line with state and in line with local. This is not just a Berkeley thing. Obviously, this is a United States thing. This is a world thing. Yeah. Um, you know, this is happening. We're the canary in the coal mine in California and the Bay Area. It's happening and it's spreading all yeah. throughout the United States. They all think it's just California and et cetera, et cetera. It's always us, you know, hippie, whatever the hell's. But it's not. It's it's gonna be an epidemic problem. It is already an epidemic problem here. It's spreading and it's gonna get worse before it gets better. We need more housing. We need organized subsidy, uh, section eight type style through the line, subsidized 
what we cannot afford because people need to be in housing. Obviously, we need to build more housing, and so let that be as well. But we need more legislation to at least have affordable housing and also to have it subsidized so that people that can no longer need to have to put up tents, you know, and that, by the way, is the only alternative, and that is the civil way that should be allowed in the, in the very short run because there is no other alternative for these people, right? And it is ridiculous. But uh, I'll leave it with that. Oh, one, 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 one quick, uh, I just want to, I, I did, I did uh, open this up because I just wanted to show you guys. I never knew this man. I met him one time when I was 16. But this was my, my birth dad. I don't know if you see any similarity. My, my, I want to call him my sperm donor because I consider my, my, my adopted dad my real dad. But this guy was also, they call him Crazy Hyde. Uh, he was a Dutch dude. And anyway, he lost all of his money because he was against some ordinance in Switzerland around Geneva to, uh, his house was too high and he fought it and he lost all his money. So back in Holland, they call him Crazy Hyde. But he was always a person that would hang out with every type of person. And I took that actually from him because I learned that a long time ago. And I know you, I know this is all about me all of a sudden, but I don't want it to be about that. But I think basically I, I grew, I, I, I was attracted to him initially because he kind of looked like my real dad. And I found out that he had, my, not my real dad, my, my sperm lord dad, and that he had my, my real dad's first name. That's how we kind of got started. And I'm pissed off that he's dead, to be honest. Thank you very much, guys. All right. Thank you. Good. Rest in peace, 300. This is a great dude. I, sorry, guys. All right. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Dossie Bates here. A uh, long time Berkeley citizen. I used to walk down Shattuck Avenue, and you say they're going to be at the city council meeting tonight? Well, I don't know. And he said, you better be. And uh, it's funny, uh, people, uh, one point I got compared to him, he said, somebody said, well, you're both nuts, but you make sense. Well. I said, okay, I accept that. <laughs> but uh, the point here is, what we're talking about is the banality of evil, which is being done and perpetuated upon the poor, the unhoused, anybody in distress around here. Uh, the rich people that are coming into town, the gentrifiers, are forcing people out on the street. The greedy suckers that come in here and buy low and sell high and then leave the city and don't live here. They want the police department to enforce unpopular laws, which makes the police look bad. The city manager had a lot of nerves showing up today. I mean, talking about the banality of evil. She who condemns tented cities, encampments around the area, declares them unlawful, takes away their sanitary devices, doesn't pick up their garbage, and they say, oh, look at them. What a load of crap that is, you know? I don't support the police, I never have, but I don't think it's really good to put upon them enforcement of laws that people who are safe in their offices condemn people for, you know? That's not right. It's not right. The police are not social workers. We should not be put in that situation. The city council should be ashamed of themselves for what they've done to the poor people in Berkeley. They should be they should be totally condemned constantly for their acts against the people of Berkeley. Most of them, not all of them are poor. But unity comes with a price. Unity comes with a price. And the price is often somebody's sacrifice, whether it's voluntary or involuntary. He was a good guy. God bless him. I don't believe in God, but I say God bless him anyways, just in case. You never know. So, rest in peace, 300, and may you all be better people as we saw Thank you. I'm going to lay in the chat. 
I first met 300, 300 years ago, no, five years ago, when he screamed at me and he thought I was trying to poison him by offering him soup. I then dubbed him Monk Man and suggested that the other drivers not stop for him because he would just yell at us. And I don't remember how long it took, but eventually he asked us if he could get some soup. And that was when I, un I started talking with him. And I didn't get to know him very well, but I gave him an ear whenever I had time to give him an ear. And sometimes he took that ear a little bit too far away. <laughs> and it was like, I gotta go. Yeah, I know, I know, I know. And then he started hanging out near where I live and I'd see him outside of 7-Eleven and he'd introduce me to other people he was holding as what I call a captive audience. <laughs> and uh, some people like me don't know when to shut up. After making a point, I should learn how to do that. But he was, he was one of our eccentric characters, and I always love eccentric characters. And I know I'm preaching to the choir here, so I'm not gonna say this, that, and the other thing. And I think that housing is important, but I think community is more important. And I think that we need to learn how to be community. We need to learn how to look people in the eyes and say hello. No, I'm sorry, I don't ever give out money, but I get it, and I hope you're gonna be okay. You know, there are people that support the unhoused, and there are people that don't support the unhoused. And I challenge those people that don't support by just riding in the van with us one night to see who's out there. It isn't hordes of people from out of state that are coming to Berkeley because we have all these resources. We don't. You know, it isn't that, you know, when you get asked to move, you get a voucher that's worth anything more than the paper that it's written on to go sleep someplace that night. I think we learn, we need to learn how to have empathy. We need to learn how to have compassion. And I think most of us here do. What we need to do is teach the rest of the people. Challenge your neighbor one time as you're walking down the street to say hello to somebody that's sitting or laying on it against the law, or who's trying to huddle in their three by three foot private space. We've got to do something. There is so much going on in this planet right now and in this country right now. Pick a cause, do something. If you're not doing anything, you're part of the problem. And there are always things that we can do. And it's gonna take an army of advocates and an army of lovers to change this planet. And I don't know that I can do it on my own. I know I can't. And I don't think Willie can do it on his own. I don't think Cheryl Davila can do it on her own. I don't think any of us can. We've got to do community. We've got to talk to our neighbors. We've got to talk to people in front of us online at the grocery store. When I'm buying 30 bags of candies, I, I tell people, oh, this isn't for me. And then I start a conversation about consider the homeless. I spread the word constantly, constantly. I never stop working. You know, I, sometimes I feel like that clown that you punch in the nose and they fall down, but goddamn, that clown gets back up again. You know, and I keep springing leaks lately, and it scares me, and I just came out of another week of PTSD episode because I made the mistake of going to a federal court to watch trial one day. And sadly, sadly, uh, it didn't go the way we wanted it to. Don't give up is what people keep telling me. Don't give up. Get more brazen, get more bold, stand up. A lot of people can't anymore. And we are systematically, slowly killing people on the streets of the sanctuary city that has no sanctuary for our economic refugees. 
poverty is not a crime. People are not junkies and drunks before they get on the street. They become that on the street. It's all they have to take the edge off. If you're living under constant pumps of adrenaline, it's going to mess up the synapses in your brain, and you're going to have some mental disorders. If I didn't take my morning cocktail, I would be a very probably violent person. I've got years of rage inside of me that just waits for a target sometimes. And then I sometimes take it out on myself. We need to keep doing what we can. Try to just look people in the eyes, try to spread the word, try to show some compassion and empathy, try to do what you can. And if you're not doing everything you can, you need to learn how to ask yourself why not. Chow 300. sitting here and listening to what everybody's saying about 300 you know, it, I have to say some stuff you know and and I think the biggest thing that I have to say is two to three weeks ago I warned City Council and the mayor that 300 was gonna die on the streets I warned them in an email and I explained why he was gonna die and I explained the situation on the streets as far as 300 goes it was a very unique story and what happened in the email was that I was immediately chastised for saying such things now 300 is dead. Of the city council members and the mayor and the people that were on that email list, Cheryl and Kate are the only two that made an effort and they failed. And the reason they failed is because the programs that they needed have not been put in place. And it's sadly ironic that the programs that they are responsible for putting in place were the ones that were needed. It's, it's just very distressing to know that this man could have been saved. It's, it's, it's just shocking to be able to sit here and hear the things that this man has accomplished and the people that he has influenced. I've known Cody's story. I did not know who straightened him out, 300. That makes you a tremendous man to be able to take that type yes. of hatred and turn it into love. Yes. 300 was part of a couple of our protests for sticking for the homeless protest. He was not an active participant, but he was an angel on my shoulder. And his advice and just his way of being had an influence on the movement because we are not a Berkeley movement. We are a nationwide movement, but we operate in Berkeley because only in Berkeley are we gonna be able to make the difference. And I keep saying this, the city can change the world. It is you people that make this place so special. And I'm, I'm seeing a few. There should be thousands of us out here because I wrote the op-ed that said, they told the truth, guys. Come on, it's everywhere, it's coming, and nobody's doing anything to prevent it. Instead, they're pricing. Instead, all they're doing is more of the same. There's not gonna be a country left in a few years. It's that simple. The rich are gonna have everything, the poor are gonna be in the streets, and those in the middle, are gonna be so busy trying to survive that they're not gonna be able to fight for their future. We need to, as a city, we need to step up and we need to solve these problems. We don't need to talk about these problems. As a movement, we failed 300. Our group knew, but was unable to act to save his life. I am no longer close enough to get on the streets to do what I'm good at, which is getting into the homeless community and pulling the most vulnerable out and getting them into camp. I did not know if 300 would fit into camp because of the way camp is set up, but I know that he deserved better than dying on a bus stop bench. I'm sorry I failed you, 300. 
what has happened will not be forgotten. In all the years I've been helping homeless people, I have met two out of the thousands that were angels, that were innocents, and that had a staggering impact on the way I feel, and 300 was one of them. I'll miss you, 300. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Thank you. Um, so does anybody else want to speak? Because uh, otherwise we're going to end it up. And I... I Pardon? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, re I remember way back when Eric was on the ballot to be mayor. Okay? He was running for mayor. He came around. He told us all how woke he was and how... <laughs> He was going to reaffirm Berkeley's status as a sanctuary city, and on and on he went. And after a while, I began to get away from the hype, mentally anyway, and I came to a prediction that he would do nothing for the homeless. Well, sadly, that prediction's come true, and it's even worse, he's actually persecuting the homeless. Mayor Aragon and his stooges in the city manager's office are the ones that control the police. That is why I don't go and advise people to yell at the chief. I don't go online and talk about how much I hate police officers because in reality, police officers are just members of the proletariat like you and me. And they have to take orders from their superiors. And if they don't take those orders and follow those orders, they can be fired for doing so. There is a case in New York City of a police officer refusing to arrest a homeless person. And he was placed under disciplinary proceedings by the city of New York for refusing to execute that command. So. I'm not interested in this anti-police rhetoric that a lot of people are interested in. I'm interested in anti-politician rhetoric because sociopaths like Mayor Aragon and the city manager, oh, wait a second. They tell the chief over here what to do. He then tells his officers to do it, and it goes on down the chain of command down to the beat cop. Okay? So if we want this to stop, the people that control the police, that tell Chief Greenwood what to do, need to be held accountable. And the first step is to understand that Jesse Aragon is a bigot. He doesn't care about homeless people. He never cared about homeless people. Everything he ever said during his goddamn <laughs> campaign was a lie. That's the first step. And then the second step is we need to stop voting for people like Mayor Aragon. When people get on the campaign trail and talk about how woke they are, that's a pretty good sign that they're not going to do anything for the marginalized people, they claim that they're going to protect and advance the interests of. And, and this isn't just, you know, we, we hear a lot about how Republicans are evil, and yes, there's a lot of evil, racist Republicans like Donald Trump, but all of the people that are causing problems in Berkeley, all of the people that are passing laws to, to persecute homeless people, all of the people that are telling the police to harass homeless people are not Republicans, they're not conservatives, they're not alt-right, they're Democrats, they're liberals, they're to the left of the political spectrum. Some of them are even outright socialists, but yet they persecute homeless people. So it's, it's not just Republicans, it's Democrats doing it too. And the problem is, is that people in California, 
you know, they, they vote based on political party, based on ideology. And I know that they mean well, they, they want problems like the environment and homelessness and crime and, and other things to be solved. But these politicians, they're, they're ideologically and they're morally bankrupt. And these people that run around on the campaign trail talking about how woke they are, they're filled with just as much hate as, as Nazis and alt-right are. They just package that hatred in different language. And I, I read an article today in the Chronicle about Berkeley's housing crisis, and there was a quote from um, Mayor Aragon, and he basically talked about how he allegedly got complaints from business owners and homeowners, and thus he had to do something about the RV campers. Okay? So, Mayor Aragon, you know, he's not going to come out like a Nazi and say, I hate blacks and Jews. No, he's not going to do that. He's, instead, he's going to come out and he's going to say, we have to do something about the RVs, you know, because they're causing problems for livability, blah, blah, blah. Because he can get away with doing that. They do that instead of coming out and saying, I hate homeless people. But, but the ideology, the hatred is still the same. And that's what, we, that's what we are dealing with. We have a bigot in the mayor's office. We have a bigot in the city manager's office. And nobody's doing anything to hold them accountable. And it pisses me off. It makes me angry. And now 300, 300 is gone. And, and 13 before him passed away on the streets of Berkeley. He wants to talk about sanctuary city he says that, that if you come from another country, you're welcome to be here in Berkeley. But if you don't come from another country, you're, you're just a poor person who can't afford to pay rent, you're not welcome here. Fuck that. We're, either all of them are welcome here or nobody's welcome here. You know? anyone's grief because I feel like grief needs to be felt and I just want to say that and listening to folks and you know take the time it needs you don't want to let it run its course I think that's important and in listening to people the passage that came to mind to share or to read in closing was Isaiah 61 and it's an Old Testament prophet and I have always felt that 300 though I didn't know him very well at all he had the heart and the fire and the spirit of an Old Testament prophet. And if you saw him on the street, that's what you thought of. And if you saw him before council, that's what you thought of. Like, when he spoke, and God spoke through him, which I believe he did, he had God's heart for the poor. And so this, this text that I'm going to read is, uh, I'm going to, I'll read most of it in closing, but it's also the text that Jesus himself read when he entered his formal ministry. And I just feel like it accurately conveys, I'm like, I also believe that, you know, 300 is more alive than ever. He has risen with Christ who he is now, and I believe that he is interceding for our city. And it's been a really hard week in Oakland as well, I gotta say, like between here and there, I know a lot of tired, grieving people this week, this month. Um, so as I read this, I'm just praying, I feel like we're praying with him for this place. Because the Lord has anointed me. He sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and to release the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God to comfort all who mourn and to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning and the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord 
to display his glory. They shall build up ancient ruins. They shall raise up former devastations. They shall repair the ruined cities and the devastations of many generations. For I, the Lord, love justice. I hate robbery and wrongdoing. I will faithfully give them their recompense and I will make an everlasting covenant with them. Their descendants will be known among the nations and shall acknowledge that there are people whom the Lord has blessed. I will greatly rejoice in the Lord my whole being shall exalt in my God, for he's clothed me with the garments of salvation. He's covered me with the robe of righteousness. As a bridegroom decks himself with a garland, and as a bride adorns herself with her jewels, for as the earth brings forth its shoots, and as a garden causes what is sown in it to spring up, so God causes for hope. Amen. Amen. Thank you everyone for being here. Thank you Chief for having us on the steps and hanging out till it's over. And um, thank you Marsha for setting this all up and blowing up the picture. Um, you can take one of the flowers arrangements, Marsha. You should take one, so I'd give one to the chief since he allowed us to be here and didn't say no or anything. So that was just, well, you know, you never know. You know, I was like, you. so I, I'm grateful that we were able to hang out here this evening and honor 300 who deserves. And I'm sure he's up there um, really happy that so many people came out to honor him. And Dominic, thank you for helping me um, envision this this evening. And, um, and thank you everyone here for being his friend. And 300, we'll love you, we'll miss you. Rest in power, rest in peace. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Of course. I wish I could speak better. 
Hi, Christine. Yes. Hi, I'm Thomas Clark. Oh my goodness! Yes, You're the nice infamous. To meet you. Sorry, I've had to be this yeah, day. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me turn this thing off. Yeah. 